you've ever watched or even followed a sports team, you know that they almost always have some sort of a team mascot. Now, a mascot is something or someone that associates with the team's name. And that something or someone is supposed to point others or call attention to the team. And some mascots do a good job at this. If you take uh, the University of Maryland, they're the Terrapins, and so their mascot is a turtle, right? Simple. UCLA Bruins, theirs is a bear. Got it. The Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, Buzz, the Yellow Jacket. Simple, right? You would think it would be pretty easy to accomplish the, the art of having a mascot. <coughs> Not so with other teams. The Wichita State mascot is a big muscle-bound giant bundle of wheat <laughs> called Wushak. They're the shockers, which is an old term for harvesting wheat. The University of California at Santa Clara, you know what their mascot is? Sammy the Slug. <laughs> that is the slowest basketball team you'd ever want to watch. Delta State, they are the fighting okras. It's a big okra fruit, vegetable, with boxing gloves. <laughs> The New Orleans Pelicans down in Louisiana. Their mascot is King Cake Baby. It's this gigantic head, freaky looking, creepy looking baby with a big crown and diapers. <laughs> the Pelicans? I mean, there's others. If you do a little research and find out, there's a Zippy the Kangaroo, 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 Kangaroo. Well, I can't speak. You can't, you can't order these in the mail. <laughs> Zippy the kangaroo, they got a Peter the anteater. At least it rhymes. <coughs> Digger the dinosaur. Artie Artichoke is a mascot for a team. And Dartmouth College. Well, at least they were honest. The college team, their mascot is Keggy the Keg. <laughs> and then there's everyone's favorite, my personal favorite. Evergreen State's mascot is Speedy Geoduck. Now, Geoduck isn't a bird. A Geoduck is the world's largest burrowing clam. They're the Geoducks. Now, to make sure the people who come up with some of these, I'm wondering if they didn't spend a whole lot of time with Keggy the Keg while they were coming through the process. <laughs> So if you think about it, what a mascot ought to be, I would suppose that if you were going to come up with an official mascot of a biblical prophet, you most likely and most probably would come up with John the Baptist. He would be the best choice. And a couple things. First of all, he looked like what we think an Old Testament prophet would look like. Lived out in the woods, an austere existence. His clothing had a robe made out of camel hair, all big giant belt. We envisioned him with wild hair. Well, if he lived out in the forest, I'm pretty sure he didn't have a curling iron and a comb. Big, full beard. If you read Matthew and Mark, they say, and what he used to eat was just, you know, honey and bugs, locusts. You wouldn't think he'd be but so big. That's all they did. It depends on how much honey you put on. So he would be like what we would think they would look like. And secondly, we understand that he would be a prophet because he was called and he was commissioned by God for a very specific purpose. I mean, even before he was born, God appeared, uh, sent his angel to deliver the message to his parents to be, and said that they were going to have a child. And he was going to he was going to have his existence 
Because he was supposed to go and preach and point people to the coming of the Messiah. He was supposed to go and tell people about the Messiah. You know, that's what a prophet is. You know, the word for prophet means literally means to a spokesman. Someone who is speaking for God. That's why all through the New Testament, Old Testament, that's all you hear. Thus saith the Lord, the Lord saith. It's over and over and over and over. That's because that's what a prophet does. God is speaking through them. And it certainly is what John the Baptist was doing. So not only did he have the appearance of what we think would be a prophet, we understand that his divine commission is something that, that should make him the best candidate for being a mascot for a prophet of God. But there's one more way that is evident. One more way to see how John the Baptist fulfilled this position as a prophet. And that he was the perfect mascot. And it was his attitude. You see, he had an attitude of humility. Of humility. Our passage this morning that we're going to look at talks about this very attitude of humility. John, chapter 1, verses 19 through 28. John 1... 19 through 28. As you're flipping your pages, realize the prologue is finished. The introduction, he is finished. John the author, the apostle. And now he's beginning to tell the story to support the evidence of all the things that he said back in the first 18 chapters. And he begins with, in verse 19, And this is the witness of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, and he confessed, I am not the Christ. And when they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. And then they said to him, well, Who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? <clears throat> and he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet has said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. And they asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, or Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. If anybody had anything to boast about, it would have been John the Baptist. He could have said, look, I was chosen by God even before I was born. Matter of fact, when I was born, it was done supernaturally. Because my parents were past the time that they could have children, and yet God had me born and set me aside for his service. I am something special. And since there hadn't been a prophet in Israel for over 400 years, since the book of Malachi, I'm going to tell you, if he showed up as a prophet, he'd be somebody very, very important and special. And if you look back, you can say, look, you look at all the prophecies in Isaiah and Malachi and all the lot of other assorted prophecies about me. Well, I'm here to fulfill them. I'm important. And every single Jew who lived was conditioned and schooled to look for his appearing. Because the prophecy said once he, once he got there, the Messiah was coming right after him. He was the forerunner. That's what the angel told his parents. That's what the prophecy said would happen. So if anybody had anything to brag and boast about, it would have been John the Baptist. He could have lifted himself up above all the other people and all the previous 
prophets and said, I'm the biggest, the baddest, and the most important one, and here I am. But when that delegation came, that these are people who came from the religious leaders that were in Jerusalem. And see, they had heard, if you read in Matthew and Mark and, the, and, and Luke, it says multitudes, huge, huge multitudes all through Judea and all the districts around them. They heard about his ministry. And they were flocking in droves. And so the religious people in, in, in Jerusalem were going, do what? Where? Who? Why? You and you and you and you and you go with them and find out who this guy is and what he's doing. Everybody is going to see this guy and hear him preach. And so this was the delegation that showed up. And the first thing they said was, hey, are you calling yourself the Messiah? He said emphatically and repeatedly, he says that he confessed twice. No, I am not the Christ. Christ is the New Testament word for Messiah, which is the Old Testament word. It's the same thing. I am not the Christ. No way. Oh. So are you saying you're Elijah? Are you Elijah? And he said, no. That's not me. I am not Elijah. See, Elijah was one of the most honored and respected of the Old Testament prophets. He said, no, that ain't me. <clears throat> Way back in Luke, remember when the, I told you the, the, the angel appeared? When he brought the news about the coming of the uh, coming birth of the little John, that he would, his purpose would be a forerunner before the Messiah, and the angel said he would come and be the forerunner in the power and spirit of Elijah. So John the Baptist was correct, even though he was fulfilling the ministry of, of an Elijah. He was absolutely correct in saying, I am not the reincarnated physical Elijah. I was born, I'm John. I'm not Elijah. So, if you're not the Christ, and you're not Elijah, are you the prophet? The, 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 uh, the prophet. The one prophet. Who are you talking about? Are you the prophet? Well, back in Deuteron Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy, 18.13. Moses knew that he wasn't going into the promised land. God had already said, you're not going. But, and they were all getting bummed out. Well, who's going to teach us? And, who's gonna... and so Moses told them that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. That means from your countrymen. Another Jew. God will at some point in time raise up a great prophet. And Moses said, and you shall listen to him. That's the prophet. They've been looking for that prophet, the one that Moses talked about. Moses said, I'm not the prophet. John says, I'm not the prophet. Because that prophet is Christ. They both said, we're not him. That's not us. And so they said, well, okay, let's get this straight. If you're not the Christ, and you're not Elijah, and you're not the prophet, who exactly are you? We came all this way to see. We heard so much about it. Who is it that you say that you are? Who do you think you are? <clears throat> what did he say? I'm a voice. I'm just a voice. I'm of no real consequence. Who I am is nothing. It is not me who is of importance. He says, I'm not even to the status point of being worthy of someone whose job it is to unstrap the sandal of the one who's come. There was always somebody in the household, one slave, and he had to be the lowest of the low slaves. And his job was that anybody who came into the house to visit, you didn't wear your shoes inside. You had to have your sandals off. Now you've got to imagine, these, some of these people hadn't bathed in since it rained last. And they're walking around in these sandals, and they're hot, dirt, and uh, um, some beautiful feet. No pedicures back in those days, unless you were... Queen Sheba. They said they had one guy in 
and they, I don't know if they drew straws or what. His job was, as everybody came in, his job was to undo their sandals and wash and wipe the feet of anyone who walked into that house. You talk about a low position. There's nowhere to go but up on job opportunities. And he says, I'm not even that good if you compare me to the one who was coming. You see, if you came to see someone, who you see is not important. What's important is what you hear. I'm only the voice. I'm the one telling everyone that the Messiah is coming. As a matter of fact, He is amongst us. We know next week we'll find out. He hadn't seen Him yet, but He knew He was coming. Remember, He has been operating under the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwelt him even in the womb and has been leading him and guiding him all these years, these 30 years. And he knew that now was the time and this was the ministry he had telling people to repent, get your heart right. God is going to be here any minute. <coughs> you better prepare yourselves for his arrival. This bold and brash proper. And we know he's bold and brash because of the things he says about some of the leaders in Jerusalem. He spoke God's word with conviction and perseverance. This prophet who fulfilled many, many Old Testament prophecies this prophet who created such an uproar and caused so much chaos and confusion and disruption in the religious community of that day and in that society. This prophet, this man, humbly confessed, I'm not important at all. I'm nothing more than a voice. God has given to us John the Baptist, not only to be a mascot of the Old Testament prophets, but also he gave us John the Baptist to be a mascot for us today. A symbol of what we as Christians are called to be as a witness for Jesus Christ. Now, we don't have to be covered with some scratchy old garment. And we don't have to spend all day long every meal chopping down on those honey covered bugs. We don't have to do that. But here's what we do have to do. We have to be humble before God and man. Humble. And we have to be a voice. Because who we are is of no importance. <coughs> it's the voice. Earlier, we were already told that Jesus Christ had, had, had given us the right to become children of God. That's who we are. That will be completely manifest down the road. But in the meantime, who we are is we're a voice. We're commissioned to go and tell. That's what the voice does. But in order for us to do that effectively, we have to forget about ourselves. Because we still have a tendency to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, as the Bible counts us. Like John the Baptist, we need to be concerned, and our greatest concern should be for other people. <clears throat> he spent his days as a voice telling others, guiding others, preparing others to meet Jesus. He said, Jesus is going to be here any time now. The Christ is coming and He's among you and it can happen at any minute. That's the message that we are called to give today. For the rapture can happen this afternoon. It can be next Thursday. We need to tell people that it's imminent and He's coming. We need 
seem like, John, we need to make that a priority in our lives. But that's going to require us to do a few things. It requires that we have to set aside our own personal likes and dislikes. I like that people, I like that person, I'll tell but I don't like those people, let somebody else handle them. We have to put aside our own personal likes and dislikes. You think John the Baptist was there going, yeah, I'll baptize you, and nah, not you, and you get up, nah. Do you think that was the case? We have to forget about our own selfish needs and our own selfish desires as we attempt to lift ourselves up. Remember, we're just a voice. And we need to give up things, like I want to be willing to give up our own free time and to give up our own you know, uh, possessions and monetary collections. If that's what it takes to be a voice, we need to be willing to give all of those things up. And we are called to do so. That's what John the Baptist did. Didn't he? And you said, well, yeah, but, but, but no, John the Baptist was special. I mean, he was the product of a supernatural birth. I mean, God uh, commissioned him and controlled him by the Holy Spirit. Truth is, every Christian meets those exact same criteria. Every Christian exists as a child of God because of a supernatural birth. When you were born again, having given your life to Christ, you got a supernatural birth and you resonate to it. And we were commissioned by God. Didn't Jesus, at the end of Matthew, go ye therefore and what? <coughs> tell. Make disciples. Get out there. Tell people. Lead them and guide them. Because I'm coming back. And every Christian is indwelt, empowered by God the Holy Spirit just as John the Baptist was. So what's the difference in how we approach our lives to how John the Baptist? If we've got those same things as he has, what's the difference? <clears throat> it's humility. It's humility. Humility is the practice of honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness. When the world is not about us, but it's about God. That's humility. It's the willingness to surrender our way, our time, our possessions, back to the glorious God who gave all that stuff to us in the first place. That's humility. And when we live a humble life, dedicated to being a voice of the glorious gospel, we point other people who need to hear about Jesus and his return. When the world sees us and hears us in that way, aren't we being mascots for the God and Savior that we represent? Is that not the way we point others to his grace? Our message today is a reminder of who it is that we represent and how God chooses us to use our humble witness to call others to himself. May God impress upon our lives the urgency of being that witness in the days that we have before us. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Bow with the Lord God. First and foremost, ask your forgiveness for not living, living the type of life that we all know that we should live. Of not taking advantage of the opportunities that you have given us. Of not using the gifts that you have so graciously bestowed on us for your kingdom. And Lord, we confess our proud hearts that tend to look at ourselves as more important than the commission that you have given us. So Father, I ask that in the days and weeks and months and whatever time we have left, 
in our humble service for you that we might point others to you and allow our voice to draw them through you in faith into your kingdom. And it's in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen.